From the second floor of the Duncan Student Center, we bring you Shamrock Sports, Austin Rooney, alongside Ellen Geyer and David Korzanowski. And David, this is quite a matchup the Irish have looking to rebound from their tough week against Georgia. No question, Austin. Notre Dame's a top 10 team, and they're going to come out angry this week. Yeah, I think so. I think they have plenty to be mad about after that close Georgia loss. So I think this Virginia game is going to define the rest of the season. So Let's talk Irish football. It's all next on Shamrock Sports. Hello. I'm Father John Jenkins, oh, president of the University of Notre Dame, and thank you for watching Shamrock Sports. On third and eight, drops back, the Irish break five. Thrown to the left, intercepted, Kyle Hamilton will go, touchdown Notre Dame. First and ten from their own 42. They give to around the right side on the left. Welcome you back inside the second floor of the Duncan Student Center. Again, Austin Rooney, Ellen Geyer, David Korzanowski. And guys, let's talk about the environment in Athens, Georgia from a week ago. It was something like I've never seen. Here at Notre Dame Stadium, we have 80,000 people in the stands, maybe 100,000 on campus for the weekend. This was maybe double that. Yeah, it was an insane environment to be a part of. Yeah, of course, you were there, I right? was I was there. <laughs> I, was, I was fully embraced by the Athens community. First of all, very hospitable. They were great. Yes, yes, very they nice were. to Notre That's Dame fans. Yeah, 93,246 record attendance at Sanford yeah. Stadium. Also, our Airbnb owner sent us a message. They had 150,000 more visitors than usual for a typical game weekend and over 90,000 there without tickets. I mean, the environment was insane. The town was absolutely packed and it was a lot of fun. Yeah, I mean, when everyone plays Notre Dame, it's always a spectacle. So I think the Irish always bring people out in droves, whether that's rooting for them or rooting against them. I think it's no surprise. I think that's, as, as Georgia established, that was the biggest SEC matchup in their program history. And yeah. Notre Dame certainly gave them a run for their money, but sadly this one didn't go in our favor, so. But it was also the atmosphere at the stadium itself. Yeah. I mean, that light show they had was something like I've never seen before. <laughs> they had all the fans had their flashlights on their phones up in the after the third quarter. The whole place went dark, and then they had all their flashlights up. It was a really cool sight. Yeah, there were a lot of cool things uh, that I haven't really seen at a college football stadium. It felt like I was at a concert half the time. <laughs> I mean, the light show. There were these red lights that they that they debuted for the first time at Sanford Stadium. The decibel level got up to about 112, 115. That's like top 10, top 15 in college football. Yeah. Just for perspective, the highest in the NFL was 140 with the Kansas City Chiefs, so really not much below that. It was deafening in there, and then the, the flashlight tradition at the start of the fourth quarter, that sent chills down my spine. Yeah, and in the night game, too, just makes everything yeah. about that atmosphere so much crazier. So, And being college game day, obviously, right. always, always a spectacle there. Were you so. at college game day? I was not. I was not. We were... Uh, we were at a couple Notre Dame events in the morning, and then we went over to the stadium, downtown Athens, and then got into the stadium at about 6, and the sun was setting <laughs> right over the stadium. It was, it was awesome. Uh, probably I the best the part of that game was before it started. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was a good game, though. Don't get me wrong. It was. I, mean, I was there for WVFI. It was fun calling the game, but we didn't get to go to college game day either. Sure. Got there early afternoon, mm -hmm. got in the stadium around 6 p.m. for a really fun matchup all the way through. And let's jump into the game a little bit now. Yeah. Of course, Notre Dame's offense actually looked pretty good in the passing game, at yeah. least. Ian Book shined. He did throw two interceptions, but I thought it was the best game he's had all year. Yeah, I certainly agree with that. I think he did a nice job. But, I mean, you can't win a game when you have two picks and 12 penalties. Right. I, that's just killer. So I think Notre Dame completely shot themselves in the foot. I thought Ian Book did a great job. The, the ground game was a little rusty, but... The reception, the, the receiving core looked great. Yeah. So I think I think that's just a tough tough environment to go into. I won't say he was great. I, I thought he was good. I, I don't think he was bad. I don't think he was great. I thought he was somewhere in the middle. 61.7% on completions. He was 29 for 47. Mm -hmm. 275 passing yards, two touchdowns, and two interceptions. I thought he looked a little bit antsy, kind of like he did against Louisville Agreed. on some plays. 
not not throughout the game like he was against the Cardinals in the opener, but I think what we learned is he's maybe not an elite college quarterback like the Jake Fromms, the Joe Burrows, but he's right below that. I put him at a, probably a top 15 to 20 quarterback. I will say he may have been 29 for 47, but I think with the drop passes included, he easily could have been 34 for 47. Sure. I mean, from between Chris Fink, Chase Claypool had a couple of drop passes. Lawrence this Keys was a not couple. a terrific game from the wide receiving core. I, I really, honestly, they didn't seem like a glaring weakness to me. I thought there were definitely some plays. The one that jumps out to me was the interception that went off of yeah. Chris Fink's chest. But I thought he was good. Maybe some passes he could have placed a little bit better. I thought the offense, again, was, was a little bit above average, but they weren't great and they needed to be. Yeah, and I think I think the receiving game was actually pretty strong, especially considering really? you only get 46 yards on the ground and then you're still able to compete right. with Georgia. That clearly means the receiving core was doing something right. So We'll get into the ground game in a couple of moments. I want to talk about that muffed punt, though, because the Irish probably aren't in that game if they don't get a lucky break with the special teams. Yeah, and I thought the special teams were one of, were one of the highlights for Notre Dame. Uh, Jay Bramblett was outstanding. He punted. Yeah. He pinned him inside the 20, I think, two or three times, and then – that muffed punt, that part, part of the reason that Notre Dame was able to recover that is because Chase Claypool was right there. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm not taking away the fact that it was a mistake by Georgia, but Notre Dame forced the mistake and they capitalized. Yeah, and I think, too, Chase Claypool has always been one of those guys who's kind of had to prove himself, yeah. and now he's in the top spot and he doesn't really have to, but he continues to make those plays like that, and I think that signifies what an elite receiver he can be for this team and what a good piece he can be. He's so good on special teams. I mean, yeah. Chase Claypool, before he got the reps that he did offensively at wide receiver, he was doing the same thing on yeah, special teams. All the grunt work, he's always so. the first one down the field. Mm -hmm. Someone who made his first appearance last weekend, Cole Kmet. Yeah. He was the highlight of the Notre Dame receiving corps, of yeah. course, specifically a tight end. But he had nine receptions, 108 yards, and a touchdown. He was Ian Book's favorite target last weekend. Yeah, I liked the play calling. I liked how they went to Komet a lot, Get got him his confidence back, right? Got him into the flow of the offense. He looked great coming off the end of that offensive line, and he gave Georgia's defense some fits. Yeah, I thought it made a lot of sense to give him the ball a right. lot since Georgia has such a good secondary. It's sure. hard to get those longer balls going. Although I think Book did, did do a good job with the longer balls the way he hasn't with, against New Mexico and Louisville. Um, so I think it was nice to see Komet back. Clearly we know why we miss him so much. So. And then, of course, looking into, we've talked a little bit about Lawrence Keyes III. He's a sophomore now. He played a little bit of a bigger role in this matchup. What do you see from Lawrence Keyes III moving forward for the rest of the season? Is he one of their top targets? I like him in the slot. He's, he's faster than Fink. I think Fink has experience, but I like Lawrence Keyes. He, he's explosive. He can get across the flat quickly. Mm -hmm. I like him on those slant passes. Yeah, I, I want them to get him get him more involved. I would like to see maybe a couple double crosses with him and Fink. That could really uh, throw some wrenches into the defense. Yeah, I think he and Fink could go, to go together nicely, but I think it's hard that, that Fink is so small. Right. So Lawrence Keyes kind of has that dynamic speed and the size to go along The thing with is, it. Keyes isn't big either, but he's a lot faster. Yes. And he makes up for it with his speed mm -hmm. and athleticism. So. Another part of the offense, you haven't yet touched on, the offensive line. Now, there's a lot to talk about here because for the most part, I actually thought the offensive line about it. was the <laughs> highlight of the game for Notre Dame. I thought they actually played quite well. They protected Book well on the pass rush, but they committed a lot of penalties. I, I almost wholeheartedly disagree with really? you. I thought the offensive line was the most glaring weakness for the offense. I mean, I, I understand what you're saying. They, they run blocked okay. The ground game wasn't great. It wasn't really well established. I think part of that was play calling as well. But Liam Eichenberg, four penalties, two personal fouls, and two false two starts. starts. Rob Hainsey, two false starts. Cole Komet, two false starts. He's not an offensive lineman, but he's playing I, on the edge of the line for some I would, of those. I would like to say, though, those, uh, those false starts are almost entirely due to the atmosphere in Georgia. But they knew what it was going to be yeah, like. Yeah, you know so it's here, coming. So here's, here's, here's my takeaway. I, I think Notre Dame knew it was coming. I don't think they were as well prepared as they should have been. Brian Kelly even had some similar comments this week. I think that if you're the underdog going on the road against a number three team in the SEC, you cannot make those mistakes. Simple yeah. as that. I agree completely. I, I have to disagree with you here, Rooney. I think the line was a disaster. It was a complete dumpster fire. So, so, so with, take out the, let's take out the flags. Take out the false starts. How do they actually perform during play? I, I thought, I th okay. Uh, you want to you want to I mean jump yeah. in I, I'll just say I think you could tell that Notre Dame was a little bit scared I thought they were playing conservatively the line was fine but we did not see the ground game the way we have we didn't see the QB yeah. dives we didn't see the running back dives like 
when Notre Dame was on the goal line with like two or three yards to go, they opted to pass it. I didn't like of, that play call Instead either. of yeah. um, doing the dives down the middle. So I think that's a testament to the fact that they were scared of Georgia right. and they didn't think the line could block strong enough against the Georgia But were defense. they really scared of Georgia or was it that they didn't have faith in the running game? Because Here's what I Because we got. haven't really seen much from Tony Jones Jr. Here's what all I got. season long. He was the only back the Irish had. Pass protection was okay to good. Running game. Run I'm blocking. You on that. What was the problem with the passing game? Where, well, where were look the at look at the fourth and nine. They that rushed. Was the they, only time. They rushed four. They rushed four. That and was Ian, the only mistake uh, they had. It's big. It's on. big moment. The big only, moment. There the, were zero sacks. The only. Okay, yeah, that's fair. That's yeah. fair because I think Book did a good job getting the ball out early, and I thought the receiving core was good. I, I again, pass blocking was okay to good in my opinion. Okay. I think the running game. They should have. They should have tried to get it going earlier and more often. And I think part of that was the fact that they didn't have as much faith in the line. And then the penalties are the huge drawback. And I think those alone mean the offensive line didn't have a good game. Yeah, I think that you can you can hardly win against New Mexico if you have 12 penalties. So to expect to go to Athens and win against number three Georgia with 12 penalties, just complete, completely not, not feasible. I think the false starts are one thing. For me, Lee and Eichel, uh, Liam Eichenberg, the personal fouls are another. Those yep. two personal fouls came at big points. One was on one of the opening drives yep. of the game set the Irish back, they were at the 40 moving forward and all of a sudden you get a 15 yard penalty brings you back. Exactly, yeah. and, and I thought the same thing happened at the end of the third quarter as well. You gotta remember there was a drive where Notre Dame is just down three, last you know last few minutes of the third quarter, all of a sudden they, they're stifled a little bit, get a couple penalties, Georgia gets the ball back, they go up 20 to 14 in the early fourth. I felt like those five to seven minutes were when Georgia really took control of the game. And part of it was because Notre Dame shot themselves in the foot. And I think, too, the thing you have to consider, what, what was one of the biggest pieces for me was that all those guys you ran through, Corzo, Komet, Eichenberg, Robert Hainsey, Aaron Banks, those are all veteran guys. Right. So they have no excuse. You, you know it's coming. So to not be prepared for it to that degree, I think, is just unacceptable. Let's talk a little more about the running game. We briefly mentioned the fact they didn't run the ball all that much. Tony Jones Jr. was the lone back the Irish used. They used Lawrence Keys III in a couple of under rounds early in the game, but they found no success with Tony Jones Jr. Is it a worry for Notre Dame moving forward with Tony Jones Jr.? Or are they going to be all right? I, I think they'll be fine. They get Jameer Smith back this week, and then they get Jafar Armstrong a few weeks down the road. I think the running game, I, I just would have liked to see a little bit more running, faith, running game uh, play calling as well, a little bit more faith in the backs. And I don't know if that was, you know, a game plan that they were trying to pass the ball, spread Georgia out, but I wish that they were a little bit more balanced on offense. Yeah, and again, another week where we're seeing Ian Book as one of the leading rushers. So I think that's yeah. an interesting change this year, again, as we've said before. But giving him the ball for the rush, I mean, I just don't think it's a good idea. We don't have a backup. Like, sure. all things considered, there's no quarterback controversy this year. So we can't afford to have him get hurt if we sure. want to be a top 10, top 25 team. So I think we got to get the ball out of his hands as much as possible, whether that's to Tony Jones Jr. or someone who's going long. Let's jump into the defense a little bit. And I think that that was one of the highlights of the game. I thought the offensive line was good. You guys disagreed. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about this defense because DeAndre Smith was kept in check for the most part. And then Jake Fromm, he had a good game, but the offense for Georgia did not blow away the Notre Dame defense. No, I totally agree. I think Notre Dame's defense was exceptional. I mean, they were awesome. They made stops when they needed to. They forced field goals. They were kind of bend, don't break, in my opinion. There were a couple drives where Georgia, they're up, I think it was 20 to, yeah, it was 20 to 10, and Notre Dame stopped him and forced a field goal. That Those was huge. Yeah. Field goal. Here comes the end around. Troy Cry is, is there. The and he goes. Fumbled on their own 25-yard line. Georgia recovers it, and all of a sudden, Notre Dame holds them to a field goal. They go up just 13 to 10. I think that, you know, the, the mistakes that the offense made, the turnovers that they had, the defense came in and made stops. Not to, not to mention, when they decided to kick it deep and not do the onside kick, they immediately got the ball back into the offense's hands and had them a chance to win the game. Yeah, and I thought something huge was DeAndre Swift not breaking loose. His yes. longest his longest res er, rush was for 15 yards. Right. So I think that's massive being able to control him in that way. He only he rushed for 98 yards, right. I think, which is about what he's been averaging. And we definitely speculated that they were going to give him the ball more, and I think they did, but Notre Dame was more effective in keeping him contained. Yeah. Your thoughts on the pass defense from 20 for 26, 76.9%. He had just one touchdown yeah. under 200 yards, though. I thought the secondary was good. I thought that Fromm made some perfect passes. I mean, that touchdown that he had to Cager in the fourth quarter to go up 20 to 10, back yes. shoulder, sideline, there's nothing else Troy Pride could have done. I think you can nitpick here and there. Um, DeAndre Swift hurtling over Sean Crawford. I mean, there were some plays <laughs> that like that else. that jump out. But again, I, I, I think going back to Ellen's point, they kept him contained. 
and Fromm had to beat Notre Dame's secondary, and he did. Yeah, and that's just the kind of quarterback you have at a school like Georgia, and that's what they expected, and that's what he did. I think he outplayed Ian Book is what we saw Definitely. ultimately. Book was throwing off his back foot. Fromm wasn't, so right. I think that was huge. One more point I want to bring up about the defense, Austin, is the linebackers because my biggest takeaway from the Louisville game two or three weeks ago was that the linebackers would need to play better, and man, did they. I mean, Owusu Karamoa is probably the best yeah. player on the defense. Yeah, he, he was had terrific. eight tackles, seven solo, yeah. two tackles for loss. He blew up a couple blocks and tackled DeAndre Swift behind the line of scrimmage. Are yeah, you kidding me? Yeah, those were some great plays. And, and Drew White, too. I mean, he had five tackles and mm -hmm. four, four solo. Yeah, those guys were definitely breaking loose more than we anticipated, yeah. and I think that was a huge part of the game because since Notre Dame didn't have certain pieces on offense, they needed those pieces on defense, and the defense was able to get it done, keep yeah. them in the game. Yeah. Well, we've talked about the Irish loss to Georgia. Notre Dame was not the only team in the top 25 that lost last week. With more on some of the games around college football, we sent it down to Kieran Cantwell. I'm Kieran Cantwell, and here's a recap of week four of college football. Headlining the early slate of games was number 11 Michigan at number 13 Wisconsin, each team's first Big Ten matchup of the year. Wisconsin got off to a quick start behind running back and Heisman candidate Jonathan Taylor's two first quarter touchdowns, including an impressive 72-yard sprint to the end zone. Wisconsin quarterback Jack Cohen added to that lead with two rushing touchdowns of his own in the second quarter, putting Michigan in a deep hole down 28-0 at halftime. Wisconsin cruised to the victory from there, punching in one more touchdown to go up 35-0 before Michigan quarterback Shea Patterson, who was benched earlier in the game, returned to throw two garbage time touchdowns. Wisconsin cemented itself in the thick of the college football playoff race with an early season statement win over Michigan by a score of 35 to 14. Meanwhile, in the SEC, eighth ranked Auburn traveled to College Station to take on 17th ranked Aggies of Texas A&M. Auburn's Anthony Schwartz ripped off an electric 57 yard touchdown just four plays into the game on a wide receiver reverse. Near the end of the first quarter, Auburn scored another touchdown to take a commanding 14-0 lead on the road. Texas A&M mustered a field goal in the second quarter, but Auburn struck again after halftime when true freshman quarterback Bo Nix tossed his only touchdown pass of the day to Seth Williams. Nix only needed to throw for 100 yards all day as Auburn relied heavily on its potent rushing attack headed by Jatarvius Whitlow. Texas A&M star quarterback Kellen Mond had a solid day in the box score, throwing for 335 yards and two scores, including a late touchdown pass to bring the Aggies within one possession. But in the end, it wasn't enough, as Auburn held on to win 28-20, sending Texas A&M further down the rankings and out of the playoff picture. Out West, Pac-12 After Dark lived up to the hype as UCLA finally got into the win column, improbably storming back from a 32-point deficit to defeat Washington State 67-63 on the road. There were huge games by both offenses, especially the quarterbacks. Washington State's Anthony Gordon threw for 570 yards and a school record nine touchdowns in the loss, while Dorian Thompson Robinson amassed 564 total yards with seven scores, the most important being the game-winning pass to Demetric Felton with just over a minute to go. UCLA got its first win of the season while also handing Washington State its first loss of the year. This concludes your recap of week four college football. Now back to you guys in the studio. Thanks so much, Kieran. And you talk about that UCLA game versus Washington State. It reminded me of the game between OU and Texas last year when OU almost had an insane comeback against the Longhorns. Yeah, how about UCLA? I mean, Chip Kelly, I thought he, I didn't know he was still coaching. I mean, I thought he was <laughs> completely dead. Uh, I checked out a little bit. Yeah, but, but they, they had a huge comeback against Washington State, a team that really doesn't give up that many points. I mean, 67 points at home. It's a lot. That's, I don't know. It's not, it's, not, it's not a little. <laughs> what was the last time there were 130 points scored in a football game? I don't know. We have to go back Pat in the Mahomes, records. Books. Texas Tech, maybe. <laughs> that's the that's about last I can think of. Yeah. Well, let, let's transition from that insane game into what Notre Dame's prospects look for now in the college football playoff. They've got a tough road now. Yeah. We talked about this beforehand. Before the Georgia game, I said, even if Notre Dame loses here, if it's a close game, they're out. I said, you know, that one loss is all they get. And as much as people say that, you know, they're not supposed, the college football playoff committee is not supposed to take into account previous seasons, I, I, you can almost guarantee <laughs> you can't not do. take it into account. <laughs> Notre Dame has struggled in big games. There's no secret. 
do they have any shot moving forward? And what do the teams ahead of them have to do to allow Notre Dame to get in? I think absolutely not. I hate to say it, but the season, I think the season is over at this point. Season's you, over, uh, Alan, well, come I on. Mean, okay, let me rephrase that. There's still things to be learned, okay. but we're not making it back to the CFP. Okay. If I'm the CFP committee, I'm like, fool me once, put Notre Dame in the full playoff, fool me twice. Independent teams are gone forever. It's so. Okay, okay, a couple things. First of all, they, they have a chance to make the playoff. Okay. I will go toe-to-toe -to -toe <laughs> with right, you on this, right. number one. <laughs> two, two, it's not like they got blown out here. People, you, I mean, I feel like you guys are saying, oh, no. you know, big games, they always get blown out. They, they, the CFP committee is going to think that. Well, they weren't blown any, out last time against Georgia either. Yeah, right. but I mean, I think there are plenty of positive takeaways from this game, okay. and I think it was great that they kept it close. But for me, the biggest thing is that their strength of schedule has been completely undermined in the first four weeks. So they don't have they don't have any teams left on their schedule. They don't have a conference championship. What about to play number for. eighteen, Virginia? I mean, we'll talk about. Okay, wait, wait. Hear, hear me out. Hear me out. Because I want I want to talk to you about this, okay. Ellen. Because Clemson's going to make the playoff. Their Done. their schedules their schedules easy. Yes. We can agree on that. Okay. I think the SEC gets at least one team. I th the, I SEC the SEC currently SEC has five teams, teams in the top ten, including okay. three in the top four. Okay, so I think I, I safely give a bid to the SEC. Yes. Well, that's obvious. Yeah, okay. I think that there is a chance, and again, they need some help. I'll put it this way. Notre Dame does not control their own destiny. Completely they agree. need help. Completely agree. But, but the Big 12 and the Big 10 are not great this year. I think if Ohio State loses a game in the regular season or, or falls in the conference championship, you got Texas and OU who play each other. But Wisconsin is still in it. If Wisconsin yeah. wins the Big Ten and Ohio State loses in the regular season, a 11 and one or 12 and one Wisconsin team is probably in the playoffs. Here's here's what I think. I think that Clemson and the SEC have two bids locked up. I think that if there are two lost conference champions in the Big Ten and the Big 12, which is more likely than you guys might think, that Notre Dame has a very good chance of getting in. Yes, but that's it's just completely out of their hands, and I. Think, well, yeah, but yeah, I'm not saying it's not. But I th I think that a one loss, Big Ten champ or whatever else you said. That those teams are getting in over Notre Dame because they have the conference championship. And I see where you're coming from because you said if they're two lost teams, but I don't think any of those teams are okay, going to be two okay, lost Okay, that's teams. fair. But, but here's the thing. I think Georgia has a very good chance of winning the SEC. Mm -hmm. they, they, they have the easiest strength of schedule left out of them, the SEC East. Bama, LSU, and Auburn. So right, they're in the SEC East. Along with Florida. Right, so they play Florida, Auburn, and Texas A&M. Bama, on the other hand, plays Texas A&M, LSU, and Auburn. LSU, if you can keep up here, plays Florida <laughs> and Bama. So Flor Bama and LSU are knocking, e are knocking each other out. One team's losing that game. Auburn's going to lose one of those games to either LSU or Georgia. And then in the SEC championship, you could be looking at two teams that already have one loss going up against each other in the, in the SEC championship. Yeah. So I think, But I does think a two-loss SEC team with a tough schedule no. get in over Notre Dame? No. I think they might. No, think, come no. on. <laughs> Notre Dame played Georgia within six points. Why would they it's take true. a team with two it's losses? True. Yeah. But look, it's, it's the history. I already talked about this. No. They may no. say that they don't, they don't incorporate what they've done If you the want to look at history, do. look at week yeah. three this year. They played, a, they played a playoff team close. Yeah. Well, here's, here's what I think. I think it's going to be Clemson. They played a playoff Clemson. team not so close back in January. Okay, but Clemson, <laughs> Alabama. <laughs> Georgia, and then that, that leaves one spot, and you get a one-loss Ohio State or a one-loss Oklahoma and a one-loss Notre Dame. Okay. If those three teams are competing, then you have to put Oklahoma or Ohio State in because they have a conference championship. Right, but, but again, I, I think you're undermining the fact that here, here's the one problem I always have with these hypotheticals, and I know I'm engaging in one, so I, I'm kind of <laughs> you know pot, uh, pot calling the kettle black here, but if you look down the road, a lot of things can happen. And, and when, we, when, we, when we have these conversations about the playoff, it always tends to be, oh, if Bama and Georgia and Ohio State and Oklahoma win out, but that's not going to happen. Teams are going to lose. Notre Dame's going to be going up against a lot of one and two loss teams with their one loss probably being better than most of these other teams. Right, but don't you agree that Notre Dame has no one left on their schedule? Okay, here's the th that's a good point that you bring up. UVA's in the top 20. I think... Uh, USC is flirting with the top 25, as is Stanford. Michigan will be in the top 25, even if they lose a couple games. You got to look I, at the top. I, I think the I, top I, 25 I, I, at the Georgia end of the year is not one of the top 50 teams in the country. They're a joke. Sorry, not Georgia, Georgia Michigan. Oh my Michigan. goodness! Michigan. Oh my goodness! <laughs> I'm sorry. I almost fell out of my chair. Michigan's not one of the top 50 teams in the country. No. Um. Yeah. I mean, Michigan is overrated. We can. Oh, it's something you can always agree with me on. But here's the thing, on, Austin. But you guys, you guys, look at the top 25 from the past three and four years. Okay. Teams 15 to 20 always have three and four losses. It's not like you're talking about a bunch of two-loss teams here. They can have a Michigan and a USC team 
each of which lose three games, still be ranked opponents at the end of the I game. don't think Michigan Same with Virginia. is in the top 25. I don't think that USC finishes in the top 25. I do think Virginia finishes in the top 25. I will bet you, okay, so Georgia's, Georgia will be a ranked team at the end of the year, yes? Check. Yes, obviously. Okay, so then you're looking at Michigan, USC, and Stanford maybe as possible top 25 teams? I don't think Stanford's So you think Notre Dame has four ranked opponents on their I schedule I think by the, the end of the, of the season they will have You don't have Virginia in that conversation. No, that's what he said. Yeah, I thought you said Virginia, about Michigan, Virginia, USC, Michigan. And, uh, and Stanford are the three teams you mentioned. No, Georgia. Georgia and Virginia will be in the top 25. Okay. And then I think two of either Michigan, USC, and Stanford will be Even in the top if Virginia gets spanked by Notre Dame this weekend? Yeah, because again, Notre, Dame, Notre Dame's a top 10 team here. Yeah. Just because they get just because they blow out Virginia doesn't mean that Virginia's not a top twenty-five team. Yeah. I think I think you're giving too much credit to all these teams that are gonna lose two two or three games. I mean, I definitely I'm gonna stand firm in my perspective that they're not gonna win, but I do see your point in Ohio State's Ohio State's loss last year to Purdue. Right. Things like that happen. They so happen. it's definitely unpredictable. But agreed, Notre Dame does not control their own destiny. Right, I agree. And with it's that. I think it's very realistic to think that they could not be in the playoff this year. They can. They can be. We haven't talked all that much about Oklahoma. Any thoughts on them? Are they a team that's a playoff contender? Yeah, so I was looking at their schedule, too. They have one of the easier roads left. They play Texas, Iowa State, and TCU. It, it'll be tough for them to lose one and two games, yeah. Yeah. So you think that – final decision here. Does Notre Dame make it? No. I'm not going to say – okay. I, <laughs> I, think, I don't think they make it, but they can. Okay. Right. <laughs> but they can. Cool. All right, well, we have a very special segment for you right now. <laughs> Two of our former anchors on the show, John Horlander and Johnny Soper, are joined by our new uh, analyst here, Jackson Hammond. Take it away, guys. Hey, guys, I'm Jackson. Uh, I'm here with John and Johnny, who are recent graduates back in town for the big UVA game this weekend. The big UVA game. Oh, yeah. All right, All right. Johnny, so I hear you were in Athens. You have made the trip for the Georgia were. game. What was that experience like? Yeah. Hang on, pal. Let me take the mic. <laughs> um, <laughs> Whatever Rooney just said, I disagree with him. Um, That's good to be back. It is great to be back. Athens was awesome. Here, you can have the mic back. Athens, Athens was great. It was, um, it's a great college town, and the entire university is sort of mixed or you know, meshed in with downtown, and it was a lot of fun. The environment was nuts, and you know, the game, I think we got more than what we could have hoped for, even though we came out with a loss, so we, we had a great time. Awesome. Now, John, I hear you You were at the Louisville game. How do you think that compared? Um, the environment was not as electric, I don't think, but really? uh, I got to witness a win. So I think that I maybe came out on the better, but it was cool to see Notre Dame come and play in my hometown. It's something that I've waited for for a long time. So it was really John cool. just got out of the shower, by the way. John, what were your thoughts on the uh, Georgia game, watching it from your couch? I'd really like to win one of these suckers. I mean, just eventually we're going to win one of them, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You hope so. Uh, what are your guys' uh, predictions for the big game this weekend? Uh, okay, so before the season started, nobody here expected the UVA game to be like one of the best remaining games on Notre Dame schedules, and here we are. It is. Uh, USC actually may be a better team than we all thought, so Michigan looks terrible. I just have to say, on, on the air, for the record, Michigan is a terrible football team. They are awful. They, they deserve everything that they're going through right now. Jim Harbaugh is overrated. They can't buy him out. They're not going to hire a good coach. Sorry, Michigan. <laughs> Ann Arbor sucks. It's okay. There's, I, I just, anyway, so uh, what, what, Notre Dame's going to win. Notre Dame's going to win. Right, let's hear your score. score let's hear I'll, I'll say Notre Dame. I don't know what the score is going to be, but I'll say Notre Dame by 23. What about you, John? 33-17, Notre Dame. All right, with that being said, I'll send it back up to the set. Well, thanks so much. Wait, Jackson. can I, can I call a quick time out? Go ahead. Okay, I got a picture of Johnny. I don't know if you guys can see it here. This was Johnny and I at, at, in Athens, Georgia, and he was dressed as a leprechaun. Okay, <laughs> let me see if I can zoom in a little bit more. He got the suspenders, the bow tie, the hat. I'm surprised he didn't wear the same thing here today. I really, I'm disappointed to be honest. I'm also disappointed, but I do think that's probably the best segment we've had on this show all yeah, year. Yeah. So Ann Arbor sucks. Good to know. Ann Arbor, it's yeah. true. And Some the nice team objective team conversations objective. about college no, no, towns. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. No Notre Dame bias. Just everyone. Just in spitting the facts. Exactly. That's all it is. Exactly. Well, what a segment we've got. Well, let's talk about this Virginia game. They gave their predictions. We're going to get to our predictions in a few moments. Yep. This Virginia team's 4-0. They're ranked 18th in the country. Do they pose a threat to the Irish? Um, I think, well, I, I, here's what I'll say. Before the, before the Georgia game happened, I was very much under the impression that this was a huge trap game. To me, you come out of the Georgia game, you have 
high emotions one way or another. You're either coming off a huge, a huge win or you're coming off a huge loss. And so to me, I thought for sure Virginia's a trap game. They're going to overlook it. The, everyone's just going to be too worn out. But now having seen that Georgia game and having them see or having having seen them play Georgia so closely, yeah. I've completely changed my mind. Yeah. It's not a trap game. Notre Dame is too mad about this game to let anything beyond a two or three touchdown margin happen. I agree. I think the way they would have lost this game if it were gonna happen were, were mental mistakes. But I think that they kind of dealt with those last week, and yeah. that was probably a huge focus of Kelly and the coaching staff this week was, hey, let's polish up, let's be a very sound team. I think they come out and they and they give Virginia a ride. I, I think Virginia, they're, they're a good team. Again, I think they're a top 25 team this year. But I think Notre Dame, more talented, coming off of a tough loss, they're going to be playing with a lot of emotion and intensity. I think Virginia's going to be on their heels. Yep. Let's talk about the quarterback for the Virginia Cavaliers, Bryce Perkins. He's been pretty good this season, 65% completion yeah. percentage. What do you see out of him? Is he going to give the Irish secondary some issues? So he was my player to watch, and Ellen will get to hers. 65% uh, completion percentage, as you mentioned. Six touchdowns, four interceptions. The thing with him is he's kind of a dual threat, 193 rushing yards, two rushing touchdowns. I don't think he gives Notre Dame much of a threat because the defense is so good. I mean, they played great against Georgia and one of the best quarterbacks in the country, one of the best running backs in the country. Mm -hmm. I think the secondary has a field day on him. Yeah, and I think, too, that after last week's performance, the, we see how good the defense can be. But I will say the only caveat there is Notre Dame has a tradition of playing down to the level of their opponents. So as didn't long as didn't do that against New Mexico. I know, but it's something that we certainly saw last season quite a bit. So if, if Notre Dame can, can stay up at that level that they played last weekend, they'll be fine. I've heard this point from you before. I think they played down before they made the, before they made the uh, switch as far as quarterbacks. They blew out Wake Forest. They That's blew true. out Stanford, who was a top 10 team at home. The only one I can think of was, uh, was USC, but they blew out Syracuse. I think Notre Dame has, has sort of put some of those trap games and, and dicey games against, you know, Pittsburgh is probably another one from right. last year. But I think they've limited, they've limited those types of contests. I think they're ready for this weekend. Yep. Let's talk a little bit about the receiving core for the Virginia Cavaliers. They've got three guys who have had at least 180 yards receiving so far this season. Joe Reed, Hasis Dubois, and then Terrell Jana, what, what are your thoughts on these three wide receivers? Are they going to be any sort of problem? I know you said you didn't think it was going to be much for the Notre Dame secondary to handle. Yeah, I mean, so like Corzo mentioned, Joe Reed's my player to watch this week. I think he's he's had a good season yeah. so far. He's the only guy. Uh, he's got three touchdowns. No other guy has more than one. He's twenty. He's got 215 yards on 23 receptions, about averaging just under 10 yards a reception. So I think he's pretty good. But again. Virginia hasn't seen any teams like Notre Dame. I think the Notre Dame secondary is a very good yeah. striking point for the team this year. I think he's going to do a good job, but I don't think he can do anything that's going to boost his team I um, think, to a win this Yeah, year. I think you'll see Troy Pride on Joe Reed. I love Notre Dame secondary. I mean, they are awesome. They're so much yeah. fun to watch. Troy Pride and Sean Crawford are great corners. Sean Crawford's so good in the open field at tackling. And they're safeties. I mean, they have two captains Insane. who are safeties. Alohi Gilman. Jalen Elliott, and then Kyle Hamilton is probably the best Coming freshman nowhere, on the team. Yeah. I, I think that Notre Dame's secondary locks down Virginia's passing game. They're going to have to run the ball a lot more. I think Notre Dame's up to the task. Yeah. Let's talk about the Virginia rushing game. Wayne Tualapapa. Wayne Tualapapa. <laughs> yeah. Can you say that 10 times fast? Yeah, let's, let's try that again. Wayne Tualapapa. Is that right? <laughs> I, hey. You're asking the wrong yeah, person. Wrong guy. <laughs> well, that's, that was what I got out of the pronunciation guide. All right. <laughs> He's been pretty good this year, averages about four yards per carry. He's been okay. It's not DeAndre Swift. He's not DeAndre yeah. Swift. <laughs> That's what I the was Irish say. were able to stop DeAndre Swift. Is there any way that this rushing game for the Cavaliers gets going? On paper, no. Like I, I think that the offensive line would have to have a really good game. I, I think we'll get into this a little bit more with the previews, but I think the running game, I think the defense is going to steal the show again this week. I think that they were so good against Georgia and locked down one of the best running backs in the country. I don't see how Wayne Tula Papa <laughs> goes off if DeAndre Swift didn't. Yeah, I have nothing to add. If you can shut down DeAndre Swift, you can shut You're down You're in good anyone. shape. So. <laughs> you want to try to say that name again? Wayne Tula Papa. <laughs> you should have warned me we were going to be going over this on the air. I wasn't ready. <laughs> Would have written it out phonetically with oh, some nice boy. little... <laughs> Nice little guides. <laughs> well, let's talk about the end the offense here, okay? <laughs> Wrap it up. Come on. Let's go. Let's go. Notre Dame offense here. Yeah. Are they going to be able to shine against this Virginia defense? They've been pretty good so far this year. Yeah, I think this is a game where the offense has to prove themselves because I think that the offense, 
you know, if you're looking at the two sides of the ball last week, they were probably the one that, that maybe didn't hold up their end of the bargain. I thought that the defense far outplayed the offense. Uh, they set up, you know, the first and goal situation on the eight for one of the touchdowns. Mm -hmm. they, they really didn't have a ton of drives up and down the field. I think that you try to get the running game going a little bit more. I think you're going to see Claypool have a big game because he really wasn't targeted as much last week until mm -hmm. about the fourth quarter. And also, you got some guys coming back from injury. Michael Young, Jameer Smith, and Braden Lensley. And you got to think, Lensley and Young, they are deep threats. I think you're going to see some shots early in this game. Yeah, and I think this is a game where you have to reestablish your run game right away, get them there. The same way we saw Book getting the ball to Komet last year, to, sure. or last game, to kind of get his mojo back, that's what they have to do with the ground game this, this week, I think, against Virginia. Yeah. So I think we'll be seeing a lot of reps. But please, for the love of all things, get the ball out of Ian Book's hands on the ground. That's my only ask for Brian Kelly this week. Please, I know he watches this show. Of course. So obviously course. He'll, he'll definitely listen and put that in. David, your thoughts on Tony Jones Jr.? Can he start to finally have a big game here today, break out? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, again, I think the offensive line, uh, there's a spotlight on them this week. With all the penalties that they had last week and the running game not being able to get going, I think that you're going to see him and Jameer Smith switching off carries a lot more, and that might help him. Avery Davis as well, he really didn't do much against Georgia. I think that the ground game gets going. I think they'll have a balanced attack. Is, yeah. the, is Tony Jones Jr. going to be a running back for Notre Dame for the rest of the season, or do you see someone like Jameer Smith and Jafar Armstrong really taking over that role later in the year? I think they rotate. I, I, I think they're, they don't have a guy. Last year, Tony Jones was the ground-and-pound guy. He would get you your third and two run plays. Dexter Williams was your shifty fast back. I think that this is a much more balanced running back core. Jones, Smith, and Armstrong look a lot more similar. So I think they're just going to kind of try to keep them fresh and make sure they're healthy. Yeah, I think Jones is definitely a lot shiftier this year, but he just hasn't been putting up consistent numbers yeah. the way we thought he would. So I kind of I kind of am of the mind that he's going to get replaced with Jafar Armstrong and Jameer, Jameer okay. Smith come back. Last thing on the running game, they used a couple wide receivers last time around, especially Lawrence Keyes the third. He got two rushes. He got seven yards on those rushes. The first one was about a gain of ten. Second one, a loss of three. Do you see him and some of the other wide receivers playing a role in this rushing game going forward? Well, I think that they use keys in the sweeps, right? So they use him when he comes back yeah, in motion. And yeah. then I think they do a similar thing with Avery Davis. Something with Avery Davis is he switched positions a ton. He was a quarterback, then a wide receiver, then a running back, then a cornerback, then back to a <laughs> running back. So he understands the offense really well. The time that he scored against New Mexico, he was lined up in the near slot. So I think that the you could see them trying to mix up the play calling. But... In my opinion, against a team like Virginia, try to get your actual running backs going first before you use Keys and Davis. Yeah, bring in the random guys. Yeah. Does Davis play a role anywhere? Where do you th see him fitting in, actually? Is, does he have a role on this team? I think yes, but we haven't quite seen it yet. I think if things can start to click against these lesser opponents like Virginia, in lesser opponents in, yeah. in air quotes. I, they might be our second best, they might be our best remaining matchup, yeah. to be yeah. quite honest. So. And let's jump right into those predictions now. Let's do it. Notre Dame, Virginia, tomorrow afternoon. What's your pick? David, go. Are we doing score predictions right score now? Score predictions, All right. yes. A couple quick, couple quick points. Defensive line is going to feast. They didn't have any sacks <laughs> against Georgia. The only sacks from the defensive line this year, Hayes, Heinish, and Aquara. They're going to have a field day, especially because Virginia's line, not anywhere close to Georgia's. I also look at a balanced attack on offense. I think that they're going to get those newer guys back from injury, Smith, Young, and Lensley going. I got a 31 to 20 win for Notre Dame. Okay, it's pretty close. Yeah. You know, I agree that Notre Dame's really going to get it going, but I think they're going to be very mad about last week's loss, and we're going to see it on the field against Virginia. Okay. They're going to take a beating. I say final score 42 17. Notre Dame's going to blow them away. I am going to make a score prediction this week Notre Dame 34. Virginia 10, a blowout here from Notre Dame Stadium. <laughs> that does it from us with the second floor of the Duncan Student Center and Shamrock Sports. Next is Inside the Irish at 3.30. Stay tuned. <laughs>